Today we will be discussing the DNS log for the Corelight log set. I'll start at the top, name each field, provide a brief description, and in many cases a screenshot or an illustrative example. Beginning with timestamps, we'll skip past this. UID and ID, however, this is injected from the Corelight devices themselves. These are the values that will be present in most of the protocol logs created from a Corelight sensor. And these are what provide powerful correlation and cross-correlations between different protocols, events, times, so on and so forth. Proto will be TCP or UDP. It's just the transport that was used for the DNS request. In short, DNS will always be UDP unless the response goes over 512 bytes. There's legitimate and illegitimate times in which you would see this. Legitimate being something like a, a zone transfer, illegitimate being something like an attempted DDoS attack. There is a proposal, as shown on the screen, for extending this from 512 bytes to far larger, but at the time of recording, this is far from standard. Trans ID, this can be thought of as similar to a UID or ID, only it's internal to the DNS server itself. The screenshot shown here from Splunk shows just a couple of example values and how they are far below 1%. So it's almost like a, a sequence number in a TCP connection. Uh, this is useful for troubleshooting internal to the DNS server. However, if you're going to troubleshoot a network flow or a connection or an event, you're better off using the Corelight logs or other data contained within that flow. Round trip time is exactly what it sounds like. It's simply how long any query required to finish from start to finish. As shown on the screen here, Tom Daly, I found his blog article with a quick Google search. He does a great job describing one of the more prevalent functions of round trip time other than diagnostics or troubleshooting, and that's that recursive DNS servers, and if that's not familiar, that'll be described later on, but it's also the servers that most people have configured on our endpoints. A recursive DNS server will use this for somewhat of a built-in performance tuning option. Query is exactly what it sounds like, it's just what's being asked for. There's nothing more to really describe here. Q class, this can be interesting on Trivia Night because it should always be 1. It can be 2, 3, or 4, as shown here. However, if you've never heard of 2, 3, or 4, that's fine. Most of the internet hasn't either. It, this is dating back from the late 80s. It's one of the earlier protocols that's in use that binds the internet together today and it was used for a couple of things that is no longer used for today. Q-type and Q-type name. There are a lot of Q-types. I'm not even sure if what is shown on the screen there is all of them. And as shown on the screenshot from Splunk, you don't really need to worry about most of them. This is used in many different cases, and I do not have the time to discuss each in this video. It is important, however, to know that your top 10 values there will generally look approximately like this. And the reason that you'll have predominantly type 1 and type 28 is that these correspond to host lookups, A or 1 being IPv4 and 28 or quad A being IPv6. Uh, this should be pretty typical of most enterprises. Response codes and the corresponding code names, this is what comes back after a query. It would stand to reason that most of the values coming back will be zero, which just means no error. So a query goes out and a query comes back, therefore there's no error. In the event that there is an error, there are a lot of corresponding response codes and code names, however. The authority answer bit. This is if the response came back from authoritative server. TC for a truncation bit. This comes back to what we were discussing earlier when DNS is using TCP as a transport. It just means, ultimately, that there was more to be delivered in the response than could be delivered from the result of a single query. Uh, so generally speaking, if it's more than 512 bytes and or it flips over to TCP to fulfill the response, you'll have a TC bit associated with it. Recursion desired and recursion available does require a brief explanation of how DNS works if you're not familiar. Most local enterprise servers, or the DNS servers configured on your workstations or your phones, for example, they'll pretty much be receiving recursive requests only from the stubs that are configured for them. Now, these recursive requests are not iterative, and recursive and iterative are programming terms and vernacular with which most people are not very familiar. But all you really need to know for the sake of DNS is that a recursive request is essentially saying, please find this for me, 
this is now your job to find this for me. I want the final answer. I don't want to know any parts or process of the answer. I just want to ask you a question and you provide me one answer in return. Now, the way DNS works after it's left your local servers is very, very different than the way it works with your local servers and your local clients. The responses and the requests leaving your DNS servers will generally be iterative. Now, iterative request simply means I have a request, you do with what you see fit to do with it. And if you're not familiar with root servers or root hint servers, that gets very deep into DNS and outside the scope of this video. However, a DNS request to a domain with which there is no cache or prior knowledge does go through a lot of servers sometimes in order to find your final answer. Uh, the root servers are something which essentially helps run the, the heart and core of the internet. Uh, COM servers, however, will be part of the delegative process of slowly but surely finding the authoritative servers. And the authoritative servers most people are familiar with. It's, it's the servers that are registered generally by IP to be associated with a domain. So these are the end-all be-all as far as DNS is concerned with regards to receiving any given response to a query. Once the iterative responses have run their course, you'll receive back both flags. The clients will receive back an RA as well as an RD flag. It's simply saying, you asked for recursive, I gave you recursive, here's your answer in addition to it. The Z field? Z field is currently, officially, registered as being reserved. And they say reserved for a lot of ports or portions of headers and protocols to say that this is either antiquated or just extra space, and we'll use this one day. Well, that one day is now. Uh, DNSSEC has started to occupy parts of the Z value. So as shown here on the screen, the value of zero is pretty much to be expected if you have no DNSSEC, all IPv4. If you do have DNSSEC, however, they have started to borrow this bit, so it is no longer correct to say that it's reserved. And that's why we have the one being displayed here. So there is a little bit of DNSSEC enabled. Answers are exactly what you'd accept them to be, usually. The answers shown here being uh, names and IPs, that's just simple type 1s and 28s, forward and reverse lookups. But as shown down there at the bottom, where we have time-osx and text 31 NTP, some protocols and some vendors, as large as Apple in this case, will actually use DNS to exchange information. TTLs, time to lives. These are not to be confused with something like a traceroute, which incrementally bumps up the TTLs so the packets expire. Uh, TTLs, in this case, refer to the lifespan of a cache, and caching in DNS is an extremely critical function. If we had to ask every single time where every single IP or hostname lived, it would be extraordinarily taxing for obvious reasons. And there are many, many, many components of DNS caching, and there are many, many aspects of tuning that. A higher TTL will result in less traffic because clients don't have to ask for it as often after the DNS servers have cached it. But if you wanted to change the IP to hostname mapping, say in the event of flood, load balancing, or just updating hostnames, a higher TTL will take a slightly longer time to propagate across the internet. Rejected? There's no real explanation needed here. If a query is rejected, it's rejected.